Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the panel and members of the public. I am truly honored, I consider it an honor and privilege to, to speak to you and to present to you the technology which I believe is, is eminently suitable for deployment in, in, in your neighborhood here. Uh, the technology that I'll talk about is High Storm UMAX. You will see that in the first slide. Uh, it's UMAX stands for U stands for underground, and MAX stands for maximum safety and security. It's an underground system. You're seeing to to uh, the photograph on the left. That's the underground system deployed at Humboldt Bay here in Northern California. And the one on the right is being constructed, built at Callaway in Missouri. And this is the system with material changed to 316L, as Mike explained. A, a high corrosion resistant material variation of it would be our offer to, to deploy here in Southern California. Let's go on to the next slide, please. I'm going to I'm going to speak to the four topics uh, that I understand. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm going to speak to the four topics that we uh, that Mike spoke about, but I'm going to add one little thing. I'm going to talk a little bit, just for two minutes, perhaps, on Holtec International because you haven't had, you have, don't know us, uh, and you need to know us and understand what we're all about. So if we do get the opportunity to provide the system here, you will have every reason to be enormously pleased. So we will, we will give you, we'll give you a, a, a very short overview. We'll talk about defense in depth, maintenance, surveillance, and the, manage, the aging management plan. Uh, and of course, uh, mitigation of a degraded canister talk about all these topics. So let me spend the next 60 seconds perhaps on, on Holtec International. You're looking at here the plants where Holtec currently in the United States and overseas our systems are deployed. We have 67 nuclear units that utilize our dry storage technology including the Chernobyl nuclear plant, which as you know, was the site of a huge accident in 1986. We have most, the most number of transportable canisters loaded in the world. Our whole tech user group consists of 60 members, and these people are just like you. They ask a lot of questions. They want to make sure that the programs that we have, the systems that we have deployed are indeed the safest possible. We are going to present to them an aging management program on November 10th, which is a result of significant research done by our company. To, I'll give you a Reader's Digest version of it over here in this presentation. Uh, you would notice in, the, in this illustration a number of plants are in red. Those are the plants where uh, the utility, the plant had, had a Riva for supplier and they switched on to us. They switched on because we provide solutions for their high burner fuel, for their more difficult fuel, and they needed to transition over to us. You will see in the next slide some of the examples of our technology leadership where we have led the industry in critical areas of safety and security. We licensed the first multi-purpose canister in the United States back in 1998. We secured the license for first dual-purpose cast, a cast that could be used for on-site storage as well as transport back in 1998 also. We pioneered canning of spent fuel in damaged, vulnerable fuel in canisters, and we have been canning them all over the world. Uh, this is not new submittal for us. We have been doing it. We have been manufacturing cans. We were the first one to obtain license to store high burner fuel back in 2001, and 
and we have licensed transport casks with high burn up fuel, MOX fuel, the nastiest possible fuel licensed five years ago. If you go on to the next slide, you will see the, the fleet of casks. They are all transport casks of different vintage, different capabilities. We have so many of them, we could not fit them all on this slide, so we left some of them out. But we have many of them will transport high burn up fuel. They go from a little weight, weight like 60 tons, to as much as 150 tons, with, with all different types of fuel um, that is produced by the actors around the world. Now let's talk about the, the basic system. The system we are offering here is our latest and greatest. This is the underground storage system, UMAX. We consider the system to be the last word in safety and security of storing spent fuel with currently available materials. And you'll be the judge as I describe it to you. First, to give you some, some basic, basic characteristics of the system, the canisters are stored vertically. We store them vertical because, as data suggests, and I'll show you data, if you are in a marine environment, the accumulation of solutes on the vertical surface of a canister, which is your thin wall, the, the thin wall surface is an order of magnitude, sometimes many orders of magnitude less than what you will get on a horizontal surface. I guess common sense holds it, but you see that in data as well. Also, the, if you have the fuel vertical, the pellets are lined up vertically. The lower pellet actually is shielded by the pellet above. So you have the fuel itself provides a great deal of what we call self-shielding. Another reason why we, we store fuel vertically. And a most, most compelling advantage is that you can, because the fuel is not supported on any kind of a structure, it's basic, I'm sorry, the canister, is not supported in any kind of a structure, it stands vertically on a base plate. You can examine the entire lateral surface, the entire cylindrical surface of the canister without any obstruction. The, the shield uh, structure, which is the external structure around the canister, we have always made it out of steel or stainless steel. The reason is concrete is good, excellent shielding material, but due to aging, it falls, it begins to degrade, and age is a big problem for concrete, exposed concrete. We don't have exposed concrete in our casks. Our casks are steel structures wherever there could be a falling problem, filled with concrete. Concrete is there for shielding, but it is not there to, to be damaged by the environment. Let's go to the next slide. You will see here a cutaway view, and this is just to introduce you to the terms. This underground system, if it materializes in your neighborhood, it has at the very top a three feet thick reinforced concrete pad. Underneath it is about 22 feet of also concrete substrate, <coughs> and below that there is another three feet thick reinforced concrete pad. So if you will look at that complete ISPC, independent storage facility, it, it basically is a large monolith of concrete. Now you can put it at the bottom of the ocean, it won't, water can't get in. It's got an enormous amount, besides that, on the inside around each canister we have a thick stainless steel shell that, that, that blocks any water intrusion. So you can deploy this underground system any place, whether you have high ground water table or low ground water table. Here at your plant, this system will be deployed above the ground water table, substantially above, so it's not even an issue. But I just wanted to make sure that you understand that it is because it is underground, it isn't susceptible to water intrusion. Let's go on to the next one. This slide, I'll 
Okay, time is flying faster for me than it did for Mike. Um, <laughs> the, the, Both of you are in the same time zone. <laughs> <laughs> the, you're looking at the different constituents of the, the system. On the left is the canister, and the, in right next to it is the underground system. Then we have a transfer gas, high track VW, which is important because this gas will also serve as the isolation cask in case we have in the remote possibility that the canister develops a leak. This cask is designed to thermally reject the heat and keep the fuel, keep, uh, keep the fuel cool if it had, the canister had to be placed in it. And then we have High Star 190 off-site transport cask. And I'm going to lose a bet here with my colleagues if I don't finish in 20 minutes, so let me speed up a little bit. Uh, the next slide shows you the canister. 316L stainless canister. The, the major point I want to make here is that the top lid is nine and a half inch thick solid stainless steel. Why nine and a half inch thick? Because when you do the welding and all, you want to have enormous amount of shielding so the operators don't get much dose. This is the thickest stainless canister, uh, lid canister in the industry. The next slide shows you MPC 37, the canister that we will that we propose to utilize. I only want to make two points here. This canister is designed to have a very high heat transfer capability. I use the term capability. It will reject under under NRC's temperature limits about 52 kilowatts. We have licensed it for 47. The reason is we want you want a high capacity canister so the fuel inside it at lower heat loads remains cooler. And that is the reason we have spent so much resource and energy in designing this canister. It rejects heat like a champion, keeps the fuel cool. That's the idea. The next slide shows you the vertical insertion and removal of the canister. It is as easy as lifting your briefcase. If you have the, 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 the crane, if you have the transporter, you can put the canister down, you can pick it up. And by the way, between the storage system and the transfer cask, we have a mating device where we install cameras and other equipment to inspect if we needed to. So this canister can be, any canister in this facility can be inspected any day of the week in the span of four hours. If you bring in your mating device and you bring in the transfer cask, you install it, you test it, you're not pushing anything heavier on any rails, you have something that you simply pick up and, and put it where you need to so you can inspect it directly using right equipment, inspection equipment. The next slide shows to you this PC pad on the right, our system will look like. It will have 73 uh, storage systems. In a compact arrangement, the, foot, the footprint is as small as it can get. And of course, as I said, this entire layout will be a, a thick concrete, 25 thick concrete monolith. So you basically have in the ground an impregnable structure. Look at the next slide, and you'll see what, how we have evolved. The cask on the right is the Ablo Canyon. There the cask is vertical, above ground, the technology from the 1990s, and it is anchored to the pad. The cask on the left, six years later, we had developed the underground technology, and that's your Humboldt Bay. This second cask, the canister is you know, in the ground, the lid is on the top, that's all you see. This cask, you, you can look at the slide later. All I'm going to tell you is that when it comes to seismic resistance, the California Commission earthquake, the 1.5G in two directions, this cask, this system shrugs off that earthquake. The, the stresses produced are a fraction of the limit. And RC is granting a license amendment, SER is written. It, you can see how robust it is. It is, there's nothing that an earthquake can do to it. It behaves like a monolith. It has, because it is, sits in a closed cavity, if you try to light a fire, it will self-extinguish. There's no way for oxygen to get there to continue the fire. So when it comes to hazards, there is 
there is no design basis hazard that this cast will will not handle that we can find. Uh, I'm going to skip the next slide under time pressure. I will simply point out to you here that all the beyond the design basis events, beyond the design basis earthquake, beyond the design basis missile attack, and all these we have considered, if those which are not even discussed in, 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 in the regulatory uh, uh, licensing and so on. These are all considered, and if you're interested in information, you're most welcome to call us. We'll provide you information on what the system can do. The next slide shows our shop. This shop, the only point I want to make to you, we do not, we do not hide behind non-disclosures and proprietary stuff. If you want to see what's going on in our shop today, we can get you access over the web. You can see people working, every one of them. And we make that available to the NRC. We make our manufacturing facility completely transparent to those who mean as well. And we will provide you access if you need to learn how casks are manufactured. When it comes to delivery, ask our customers. We, del we have not been late for anybody ever. We have always met requirements. The most important slide I'll show you, that's the next one, this one here, it shows that the helium in the canister on the right, it circulates. And indeed it circulates. The reason we have helium circulating is so that the hot helium contacts the wall of the canister and keeps it warm. Now if you keep a canister wall warm, then you keep condensate from accumulating and creating nucleation sites for corrosion. So the, the circulation feature that we have in our canister is very deliberate and it is very beneficial for long-term life management of a canister. <clears throat> the next slide I'll show you is the, is the forced helium dehydrator. This is another invention of Holtec. We have, we have about 50 patents on dry storage. Many of them we use in, our, use in this product line here. Uh, the underground storage system. This one is particularly useful for protecting fuel for long-term life of the fuel. This system dries fuel at a much lower temperature than vacuum drying does. And the advantage is that if you don't heat the fuel, of course, you don't cause the pressure inside the fuel cladding to rise, you do not damage the fuel. This technology, we loaned it to Chernobyl plant back in 2007, 2005, and later, of course, the whole order was given to us and we're doing it now. We, our customers use it. This, by orders of magnitude, improves the likelihood that the fuel would not be damaged during run. Now we get into monitoring and inspection. I'm showing you on the right over here a, a simple ring with a bolt clamp. You can use this, you can use this to predict the failure of your canister well before it would occur. There's an ASTM procedure for it, it's a well-established way. You basically subject that ring to a higher level of tensile stress that will adjust in your canister. You, you put it in, in an orientation that will cause maximum salt deposits, and you will see if this ring develops any, any, any damage, well, it will tell you years before you'll see it in the canister proper. We are implementing techniques like these to predict damage. Predict damage well before damage would occur. We have actually recently, with EPRI, run tests and, and collected data on salt accumulation at a plant on the east coast at Hope Creek and a plant out here at the Alvo Canyon. And both places, our tool has worked beautifully. You see the tool over here in this picture. It worked beautifully. Actually, this was the only successful test EPRI was able to do in the industry using our tool. Take a look at the deposition data for salt from this, from this program. You can see that the deposition on vertical surfaces is much, much smaller than one on the horizontal on the top lid. In our case, the top lid is thick, 
you don't much care if you have deposition at the top, you want to protect the cylindrical shell, and we, have, we seem to be, our system seems to be working very, very well in that respect. We, here we show you a research program we are running with Rolls-Royce in the UK to test the canister along the entire length using an ultrasonic eddy current testing device. And this will be developed and finished next year. At that point, we'll bring it to the United States and then we'll use it here in California if necessary. I'm going, to, I'm going to be shut down by the chairman, so I'm going to just close out and tell you that the, we have casks designed also to isolate the canister. They will be at the site, not 10 miles away. They'll be available using the same equipment. If a canister were to fail, you can put it in these casks and immediately isolate the canister. And finally, finally, to close out the argument about you need a pool, let me tell you, you don't need a hot cell, Mr. Chairman, and you don't need a pool to take a canister, dismember it, get the fuel out, and repackage it. We have the technology for it. It's being patented. We will put the detail of it, the detail of it on our website. Log on, and you can see it. You'll see a six-minute video on how that can be done. Open to the world. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Don't have to worry about. Don't have to worry about. So this has been a tremendously helpful presentation. Both presentations have been enormously informative, and I know people want to ask some questions. I think one of the, your last comment is a reminder to all of us that the technology in this area keeps on moving. So we need to think about performance as opposed to what the right exact technology is, because the technology is going to be constantly changing. Let me ask you a question. Both of these canister, both of these designs, let's set aside the issue of where the overpack is and so on. Both of these involve monitoring intensively involve inspection programs, involve, in the worst case scenario, taking the canister out and putting it in some kind of protective sleeve. Um, let me ask you about the results that you have so far from this EPRI monitoring program, um, uh, which where you detected some accumulation of salts. Are you worried about those numbers, or are those numbers, should we look at those numbers and they tell us, in fact, everything's great? Um, how should we think about what that implies for long-term aging of the, of the, of the canister? I can only speak to the data we have. First, the data is relatively limited. The canisters have been in use only for, for, can you hear me? No? The canisters have been in use only for a few years, and the accumulation is very minor. The, uh, the general evolving consensus in the industry is that you need to have 500 <laughs> milligram per square meter. Uh, here we are in the order of 520 in, in that range, so we, we don't have much accumulation. We found the canisters to be shiny, no evident damage. Now the way damage progresses is you will first, if you have salt attack, and salt is a bad word, it, I guess it's a, it's a common word. You have sulfides, you have nitrates, you have nitrites, you have chlorides, you have, you have fluorides of sodium, calcium, magnesium, you have the whole amalgam of things that, that constitute the, the deposit, and they attack differently. But the one thing is common, you're gonna have pitting first, and that pitting will then lead to intergranular corrosion. That's what the, the, the cross attack occurs. If you have pure chlorides, you end up getting stress corrosion cracking, which is transgranular attack. In either case, in either case, you first have, you will see surface indication, and Mike correctly said, before it will progress and you will have it through all damage. So yes, doing the surface examination, gives you plenty of time, and especially if you use the precursor coupons that I mentioned, then you'll know years before you'll have any damage. And so I want to go to Jerry Kerber. Let me just ask you, if you get close to this 500 micrograms number, how do you take it off? Is it a hose? Um, I, how do you oh, yeah, it? yeah. You, you will, you will, uh, one thing that we will do first, and I'll urge that to, to, to all users of systems today. I'm going to tell our customers, in, in, in two weeks. The, the main protector for damage to the canister confinement boundary is heat. If the wall is warm, then you don't have condensate that will deposit, concentrate, and become nucleation site for, for, for attack. So 
we, as Afghanistan get older, we are advising to, in a calibrated way, close the inlet vent. A small calculated amount, so your canister always stays warm. And if you do that, we expect that the rate of deposition will be significantly reduced. And you have to deposit, you have to have a, a, a relative humidity high enough to begin the chemical reaction. I think we can arrest it. I don't think that we will ever get to the point where there will be actual damage to the canister. Thank you, that's a very cozy solution. Uh, Jerry Kern? A couple questions. <clears throat> One, you may need help from Tom or Chris on, on the second part. First of all, have you had any history of water seepage in these things at all? No, no, sir. No, okay. The other one, how deep are you going to excavate in order to total excavation depth? 25 feet. Okay, and that goes to my follow-up question when you're going to, basically you're digging into those bluffs, Coastal Commission permits, so I, I don't expect you to answer that, but I expect Tom to jump right in there. Can I just add very briefly on this, because we're a little bit outside the range of the, kind of outside the main theme of the meeting, but Tom, very briefly. Yeah, for, for the pad expansion, whichever design we go with, we will follow all the appropriate permitting. So we're, we're assessing that now. We've not made any final decisions, but however we expand the pad, we're gonna follow the Coastal Commission process and any other appropriate processes. Dan, Dan Stetson, and then we're gonna go to Ted Quinn. Thank you. You had mentioned that this design is the latest and greatest of the, your current products. In a current press release, you talk about a double-walled canister that you're using in Ukraine as being safer. Is technology advancing to adopt the double-walled system? The, the double-walled canister provides different benefits. Double-walled canister basically protects the inner shell completely from adverse environment. So that is the main benefit of double wall canister. You can also realize nearly, and they use three or four stainless. They don't use 316 now. The other path is that you use a higher corrosion resistance material like 316L. And as I said, implement the, the measures that keep the pitting from initiating. And that can be done. I just mentioned one here because I'm constrained for time. But in, in, I'm going to present a, give a detailed dissertation to, to the customers of ours, the 50 customers who will attend in November. You folks are welcome to, to, to listen in if you want to. We're going to have a whole variety of measures you take to keep it from occurring. The idea is to holistically solve it, keep the, 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 the damage from beginning. Double wall is a way. And thank you for reading our website, our publications. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ted Quinn and then Gene Stone. Sure. Very quickly, Dr. Singh, is the system that you're proposing already licensed, and is, it, is the system that you're proposing deployed anywhere else? The system that we are, we are proposing here, NRC has written the SER, and the, it has gone through the rulemaking period. On November 24th, it becomes effective. So that's the licensing status of it. It is being used at uh, Callaway. We are building it. And of course, it's been used at Humboldt Bay, an earlier version of it. Gene Stone. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, uh, first, I have two or three questions for you, but I'd like to go back to the earthquake. Uh, mm -hmm. When Sons was first built, it was built to uh, point six of it. it was uh, then up later upgraded to uh, six nine, uh, as I understand it. So, what is the actual rating of this monolith that you have? We have licensed it. I use the term slightly loosely. We submitted the license for increasing the earthquake for San Onofre. Coastal Commission's numbers are 1.5 g in two horizontal directions, that's the zero period acceleration, the actual acceleration of course is sinusoidal, and the vertical G load is 1G. Now that is the, that's what Coastal Commission wants, so I'm told. We made it more severe. We put it 25 feet below, same earthquake, but 25 feet below. Now you know earthquakes get rapidly weaker, especially in Southern California. 
get rapidly weaker as you go down in the substrate. So 25 feet below, if we apply uh, 1.5 G, that's like applying to the order another 40% on top of the earthquake, I roughly estimate. And we found that our stresses, you know, the, the things that will cause the structure to fail are well, well below the limits, not even close. So capacity, we don't know how many G it will take, but it's far more than I can take. Can I just, before Gene gets to his main question, I just want to remind everybody that the CEP has spent some time on this issue, I believe, back in our meeting in May, and I'll get the transcript from that because we spent a lot of time look, translating this into the Richter scale numbers that people are more comfortable with. Thank Bill Parker for his help on that. And I think the long and short of it is that both these designs are exceptionally robust against all of those scenarios. Gene, do you want to ask your other question? Yes. So another question I had was, uh, on your map, you showed that you had uh, your products being used in several different countries. Do any of the European countries or Asian countries, are they using a, uh, are your materials that are underground, are they covered by building as well to protect from uh, external uh, weather conditions? Yeah, in Europe, they have a misperception. Yeah, the Europeans put their casks inside buildings. The reason they do that, it's been a historical practice, because they don't have huge land mass, you know, sites. Over here, you go to a nuclear plant, it's, it's bigger than Luxembourg, some sites, you know? <laughs> you, Not to despair of Luxembourg. <laughs> you go, to, you go, to, you go to, uh, to Europe, and you see people living in apartments, you know, right outside the fence. So they, to, to deal with people, uh, people's sensibilities, they put a, a structure around it. Most of these structures are not seismically qualified to California earthquakes. The cranes that they use are not single failure proof cranes. They basically, it's more of an optical protection than it's a safety protection. And that's the practice that's been in Europe forever. It's not a, this is not something that we need to be copying here. You don't really gain anything. Yeah, of course, we should not go inside the canister. You, know, you don't breach the confinement integrity to, to be monitoring for breach of confinement integrity. But there is, there is a, a, a direct way, at least in our canister, to see if you're getting any, uh, you're getting any breach of the wall. The canister, as you saw in the, in the slide, the helium circulates and it makes the lid hot. The lid in our canister is quite hot. We embed a thermocouple in the lid, and you can see the temperature fluctuation. If you had loss of helium, the temperature will drop. So, so you have to learn a lot from the temperature. We learn yeah. just by metal temperature, not by air temperature. Okay. Metal temperature is very sensitive, and in our thermally circulating, helium circulating canister, there's a direct way to measure what's going on on the inside without breaching the wall. Well, in, in, in my uh, personal belief, it is not, it's not practical to repair a canister if it were damaged. Uh, if it had a through wall, through wall damage, first you prevent it, but in the most unlikely circumstance, if that canister were to develop a leak, uh, let's be realistic, you have to find it, that, that crack where it might be, and then find a means to repair it, you, you will have, in, in, in the face of millions of curies of radioactivity that is coming out of the canister, uh, we think it's not, not yeah. that forward. However, let me, let me uh, uh, you can easily, easily isolate that canister in a cask that keeps it cool, and basically you have provided in a next confinement boundary, and you're not relying on the so that is, that is a practical way to deal with it, and that's the way we advocate for our clients. So I guess right now, I think maybe the, the confusion is if, if you found an issue, what you do is you would develop a specific repair plan based upon the specifics of the geometry location, but that is done, uh, that is a standard practice. I know uh, this, I believe it was this year, uh, Palo Verde had a bottom-mounted nozzle um, uh, indication and needed repair. We were able to mobilize uh, you know, within within weeks to be able to develop a repair plan, get it approved, and 
and, and do it. So that sort of standard practice is what, uh, when you know the specifications of it to be able to develop this. The third. Off the shelf is one thing, but a uh, plan that's customized to the specific okay. is standard practice. Right, let me ask Donna. Um, it, okay, I'm going to ask you to take the microphone if that's possible. Um, and But I want to move on to another question that you've asked. So let's keep the follow up brief. Uh, my, the NRC at uh, NRC technical meetings, a number which I've attended, said there's no technology today to repair uh, cracks in canisters, even though you can repair other material, it becomes problematic when it's full of radiation. So you don't actually have anything you could actually use today to do that and to be adaptive. Let's, let's ask both. That's, okay. what's, that's what the NRC told me, yeah. the ones that... Let's, let's ask both that question because I think this is very important. This is uh, one of the things people are discussing with me since we began. Yeah, I mean, technically that's just, uh, and again, I'm not uh, familiar with the exact context of what the NRC said, but I'll just say technically that's just not a correct statement in that we're absolutely able to do repairs on metal, which have been done for decades in high radiation fields. I, I think they may be saying that the, the specific ASME um, uh, sections have not been precisely developed for it, but in terms of technical capability, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's stainless steel. It's, it's stainless steel has been around for 100 years. We do repairs in very high radiation fields in nuclear power plants. So there's no, and again, I, I would really like to maybe talk offline and specifically understand what the NRC said. But just from a technical barrier, there, there's no technical barrier that would prevent you from doing a repair on, on a canister. Can I ask Chris? Well, this is from Daryl Dunn and Al uh, Santos. Donna. Okay, I know, Donna. I know. Donna. Donna. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Donna. Can I ask Chris? I promised these gentlemen that both of us would have that both of them would have an opportunity to talk about things. We have to honor that promise. Right. So can I ask Chris, is that do you agree with Mike's characterization of, of that actually there are a lot of technologies there? I gather there's some issues with the ASME and so and and so setting aside the ASME in, in detail, it sounds like it would be helpful for us to gather some of that information and figure out kind of how the technical standards bodies are following up. But Chris, what's your overall assessment? Well, I, uh, my personal position is that a, a canister that develops a microscopic crack, and that all it takes is a microscopic crack, you're going get, to get released to precisely locate it. Itself, the location where it will occur is, is a, a tall order. And then, if you try to repair it uh, remotely by welding, of course, remotely you can go and weld, but the problem with that is that you create a rough surface, which becomes a nucleation site for corrosion down the road. ASME Section 3, Class 1 has some very significant requirements on making repairs of Class 1 structures like the canister. So I, as, as a pragmatic technical solution, I don't advocate repairing the canister. I think that's. I think that comes out pretty clearly from, from both of the uh, comments that in these extreme events you would, you would move the can or you would replace the. Isolate. Thank you, Doctor Singh. We're in wanna, sync on that. Uh, okay, thank you. I just want to. I just want to clarify. So, this has actually been done in analogous situations on other kinds of, of pipes and things, and things like that. It just we haven't done it on these casts because it has situations not. Really There's not been a need to. Yeah. Thank you very much. Gene? Let me understand that. Uh, has, has Arriva done repairs on canisters with radioactivity inside of them? No, there's not been the need to. Okay. That is correct. There's, but there's not been the need to do it. But this is something that presumably as part of the larger R&D program, the industry would be able to demonstrate pretty pretty good. So I see both agreeing with that. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about this issue on, um, of um, the the confidence that we have that um, this cracking and deposition is not gonna not gonna happen at least in the next in the next few in the next few decades. So, Chris, I, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why you're confident that um, the the design that you have. Is not going to suffer these kinds of deposition, uh, chloride deposition, other ion depositions, and cracking. Is this driven mainly by the fact that you can keep the canister hot? Are there <coughs> what else should we be paying attention to? Well, yeah, there are many things that I didn't have time before to 
to extend it better, the, the location where crack would most likely begin are what we call heat affected zones where welding occurs because that's where stainless gets sensitized. The, in manufacturing, we make sure uh, that the sensitization does not occur. Now there is a vast body of welding literature, um, guidance on how you do welds, so you do not end up with sensitized welds. That's your first step in, in, in designing. Mike mentioned correctly that you, if you clean the surface, you create compressive stresses on the surface that protects the canister from crack from propagating. Our belief is that a canister that is properly looked after, meaning that you do not allow the combination of low temperature, high humidity, salt deposition, and high tensile stress, meaning high plastic strains from manufacturing, to come together, if you don't have the stars aligned, you are not going to get damage of the canister. And we deal with each one of these causative factors very carefully in our program. And that's how you start it. Is that, is that you have a similar view of? Yeah, very consistent. I mean, the the, the, the uh, stress corrosion cracking is very well known. The three the three factors that Chris yeah. mentioned are correct. The material, the uh, the, the temperature environment, as long as you can control them, it's, it, it's a very con controllable phenomenon. Let's ask if anybody on the CEP has questions about this before I move on and talk about a different theme. Yeah. Ted Quinn? We need to make sure when we leave this subject that we're not leaving it with a discussion of stainless steel that's not able to be repaired. Mm -hmm. It is definitely able to be repaired. Palo Verde is repairing uh, the nozzle in a much higher pressure and temperature environment this summer. I, I think I just I need to make sure it's clear and the public's not confused. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. So I want to I want to bring Tom Palmasan into this discussion here now um, because we have a couple of questions, uh, several of them including from Jennifer Massey. And Jennifer, where are you? So maybe I could ask you to come up and and let me just make sure I've got the questions right here. Um, you and others have asked questions about what is what is the schedule for removing the last. Uh, nuclear material from the site, and I think the tenor of the discussions we've had over the last nine months is we don't know what the schedule is because we don't know when and how the Department of Energy is going to is going to deliver. Is that is that correct? Yeah, you're you're talking about removing the nuclear nuclear fuel ultimately off site. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. That is correct, and the Department of Energy is responsible for that. Has not really uh, laid out a game plan that we or anybody else has a lot of confidence in. So we're responsible today for maintaining it on site until there is a place the Department of Energy can take it. For planning purposes and planning purposes only, I'm assuming it is on site until 2049, but that is an artificial date. I needed something to plan the time and do the cost estimate. We're responsible for updating that estimate virtually every year with the NRC. And as the Department of Energy's plans become clearer, we'll have a better estimate. But for now, it's going to be on site, I would tell you, for a long time unless something changes politically. Is there anything about the design that makes consolidated interim storage difficult to implement? Or you just pull the canister out, put it in a transport cask, and then send it to the consolidated interim storage facility? Are we kind of more or less understanding that properly? No, actually, uh, you're pretty close to uh, what will need to be done. Uh, the whole idea of consolidated interim storage is basically to reduce the locations where you have fuel scattered in all over the country. You bring it in one place. The, the push has been, uh, at least from suppliers such as us, to develop a universal transport cask so we can take anybody's canister and, and move it from the site to the interim consolidation site and then properly offload it. You know, in our case, of course, we are pushing the underground system. So the interim facility, the cavities will be large enough to take anybody's fuel, Arriva's fuel, all other suppliers' fuel, and you can put them in, but the process is no different than you would use at the plant, going from one location, storage location to another. And then, so you would get the canisters to this location, and then you would open the canisters and move the fuel, or you just leave the canisters intact? Put the canisters okay. back in, in the cavity, in storage, just like you had it. Okay. Now, you can, and that depends on how the regulations develop, you can redesign it so you can do a helium leak test on the canister 
you know, before you took off or after you brought to the site. We, we have actually the necessary technology to do that. So you can check the integrity of the canister before you left the plant and after it arrived there. And presumably for your design, you did the same thing. So yeah, I think just important to know, I mean, the, the sim Look, our system, uh, UMAX, was primarily driven for security. We started it after 9-11. Actually, within a few months, we formed the project team to begin this program. Now, if you look at this system, the only way for any missile, any projectile, to reach, try to reach the fuel, would be from the top. That would be got 25, 100 feet of concrete, you really can't get to the canister. But if you try to reach from the top, we put in a, a three feet thick lid, and below that, there's a nine inch thick stainless steel lid. And if you had a bomb that will push that down, that lid down, it will take enormous force. They're not conventionally available. But say 20 years from now, somebody did come up with such bomb and fell into the wrong hands, and you drop a bomb on it, it will, the, the, the top lid will behave, will basically shear, go in, hit the second lid, and then cause the canister itself, because it's vertical, it's a shell, it will behave like an accordion, and it will, it will under forces that are in the order of 100 million pounds, the canister deformed buckles, basically, but does not fail, because the, the canister material would take 45% elongation before it will crack. So the, the basic idea is that you can take enormous forces, way beyond what somebody will, other than US government, and the weapons that you can apply. You cannot really damage that canister. And say 20, 30 years from now, weapons became more, more, more deadly. All we have to do is change the lid to an even stiffer lid, and we have designs. Okay, so there is, we have designed expressly for security, for terrorism. We, we are a soup to nuts company. We do everything. Okay. We actually manufacture, we at the site, we install concrete in the overpacks, we build the SVC pad, we do everything from beginning to the end. When you keep it under your own quality organization, you have a sure quality. So we have no claims against any of our systems anywhere. There's no one person does the design. You know, there's an organization, we have about 60 people working on cast design. And we, they all operate under uh, NRC Whistleblower Act, CFR Whistleblower Act, anyone who finds, and we encourage our staff to, to speak up, every means available to us if they see that there is any uh, error deliberate or inadvertent in the work. And that is a, that's the, that's a criminal uh, uh, provision if you don't do it. Uh, I, as the quality assurance sponsor for the company, would face criminal penalties. So that is a, that's how companies are in the nuclear world. They are required to, to, to be absolutely honest. Now, that doesn't apply to a forum like this. You know, here we are talking. <coughs> But the documents that we submit to the NRC for review and any, any material that we provide is subject to, to, uh, to, to rigorous check and review internally. A typical document within the company is checked by eight to 10 people uh, before it makes a door out to the NRC. NRC actually checks our calculations. We give them our computer codes and they actually run calculations. Sometimes, they, if in case of some real uh, uh, complex calculation, they engage in our series search to, to revalidate. And often we have had heated discussions with NRC on, on a particular calculations and models. So I would say that it would not be fair to, to accuse the NRC of not doing their work right. I think they, within, uh, they have a substantial staff, substantial resources, and at least we see that they do a, a, a real, a real yeah. thorough review. Let, let, me, let me say this as clearly as I can. Our plant has every ASME code stamp. Section three, class one, two, three, MC, every one of them. 
We also have ISO standards, ISO 9001. We have all stamps, and in our shop, we manufacture two ASME Section 3 Class 1 routinely. The issue lies with the way canisters are made. The canisters, the canister meets Section 3 Class 1 95% of the way. There's one major difference. The top lid gets welded at the site, not in the shop. So it cannot be certified as a pressure vessel under Section 3 Class 1 in the shop. So what the NRC has done is imposed requirements on the, on the <coughs> testing that must be done on the canister, for example, that actually exceeds Section 3 Class 1 requirements. And we are required to do it and we have, in our case, of course, we have a Holtec user group that has its own staff of inspectors, and they check every step of the way. So actually, I can tell you from direct experience that the amount of inspection that occurs on a storage canister is far more than the inspection that will occur from ASME under Section 3 Class 1 program, because that occurs through insurance companies. You know, Hartford Insurance has an inspection staff that implements ASME inspection. Right, right. What we do through the through the whole tech user group and the utility inspection is far more rigorous, far more comprehensive. I wouldn't criticize for that. At least in my opinion, we go beyond where where ASME section three class one would require us. Absolutely. But I emphasize we have all the stamps.